So we are talking about chaos engineering. That's why I'm adding some entropy, you see, in my, in my session as well. So I said I uh, hope you are energized by coffee and ready to break things. So my name is Margherita. I'm an AWS solutions architect. I'm based in Milano. And I'm a technical person who helps uh, Italian AWS customer into their journey to cloud. I've been previously a DevOps engineer. I'm really interested and in, I'm still studying, you know, DevOps related topics, SRE, observability, and anything related to the modernized app. Today, we talk about chaos uh, uh, engineering, and I think it's a very nice, uh, nice practice. I will start by introducing some, uh, let's say, historical points and the kind of guidelines, and then I will run a demo. So I see all of people is sitting. And let's start with this very funny video. So let's focus on this guy. It's just trying to cross the street, you see. And it's a very English video. Uh, he has this umbrella and the taxi, London taxi is coming over. So he thinks that it's a good idea to overcome this, this obstacle. And it's almost done. But then we have this cascading failure, which I found very funny. And my question for you today is, have, have it ever happened to you, you know, to just maybe change one line of code or do a tiny, tiny DB change or deploy a new service version and then your entire system went down? So raise your hand if you did it, because I did. And I see many. Thank you, guys. Don't be shy today. So this talk is about this. We would like to check and prevent and understand how to properly behave when we try to cross the street, and it's not a very good idea. So, distributed system. Daniele, thank you for your introduction. You already mentioned the unnecessary, <laughs> a huge level of complexity, but in any case, distributed system, microservice system, is something very popular, and it's a kind of state-of-the-art approach for infrastructure, for application. And yeah, they are hard, they are complex. Think about how many microservices, how many link, how many dependencies between all of them. I mentioned Amazon, of course, I mentioned Twitter, Netflix, but even if you run a not so complex environment, just think about how many perturbation and failure inside your system that you can have. And even when you run a very simple, not so complex application. We have a client, and then we have a server, and then I have a message. So let's check how many steps I'm doing here. I have my client sending the message, then I have my network forwarding the message, then I have my server checking the message and validate the message, and the server then updates its own state according to the message. The server replies, so put a message onto network. The network forward the message. The client receives the message, and the client updates its own state. So I have eight different steps for a super simple way to proceed, for a super simple, not distribute, not so distribute system. Think how many failure, again, we can have in eight steps. And if I had an additional message, and then another one. So even when we talk about not so, not so complex, let's say, system, we should try our resiliency, the resiliency of my system. How to, well, maybe you have already think about testing. Testing is super good. Testing is mandatory. I'm not here to say that we don't need traditional way of testing, of course. I just mentioned two kind of very common, let's say, possibility for testing which is the unit testing. I just test one part, one specific part of my system, maybe in an isolated way. And then I have the functional testing as well, which is I know how my service should behave and I want to check the outcomes for my service. It makes sense. It totally makes sense. We can mention, you know, performance tests, integration tests, additional, traditional way of testing. But what about an unpredictable way for my system? What about the unknown? What about something I have not considered so far? That's why Chaos Engineering started. So, this kind of very nice timeline, let's start in uh, 2006, not AWS but Amazon. Uh, they run the first game day. I don't know if you ever 
been and there attend a game day before, it's super nice and funny uh, experience. It's a gamified way of learning. We just provide risk-free uh, environment and you and your team, uh, you know, needed to solve some task. And the first one was about chaos engineering, was about breaking randomly and suddenly things. And let me say this, if you work on AWS and with AWS, we still practice this kind of game days. It's called microservice magic. So if you are interested, it's a very nice way to, you know, learn in a gamified environment. And, then I, and I did it as a customer first. So the most famous one, let's go to Netflix, Sirmian Army. If you want to check the GitHub repository, it's still available. Uh, it's no longer maintained. Uh, let's say Netflix, they start a new project like Chaos Monkey that you may uh, already know, but they started with this uh, uh, why, the idea is you have this wild, crazy monkey with a weapon running all over your data center and randomly killing stuff, randomly killing virtual machines. So what happens? What should, we, what should we do? And then they added, you know, the latency monkey as well to add the latency to my network and the one checking the best practice. So they had many, many, an army, an army of crazy monkey inside, inside my system. And you can still check, again, the repository in GitHub or you can check the Chaos Monkey project as well. It's still in GitHub. It's a very nice project to me. And then we, a few years ago, seven years ago, we have principle of chaos engineering, which is, let's say, the manifesto for chaos engineering. And this is an open project too. You can go, contribute, fork, create your idea of chaos engineering. And I do love, you know, the URL, which is principleofchaos.org. And uh, let's focus on this. This is uh, the official way to define the chaos engineering, which is chaos engineering, is a discipline of experimenting on a system, and please note, uh, a few years ago, the definition was on a distributed system, because we started by focusing only on very complex sim, or on very complex system, but I want to stress this point. Don't just focus on very complex simple, a very complex system. Even your simple system needs to be tested. So chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So today we talk about we want to perturbate our system, create a perturbation model and check what happens. So, well, chaos engineering is a way of experimenting on testing my system to provide some facts, some outcomes. So is it still a way, it is still a way to, and it's still a system, a scientific, sorry, method approach, still. So let's start from the steady state. Let's start from the normal running. Let's monitor, let's observe. And I was previously an observability engineer, so please note I say observe. Observe your system day by day, week by week, uh, month by month, year over year. Check some patterns, really understand your system, it really supervise your system. Then you can start making some hypotheses. What if? What if my balancing layer goes down? What if HA proxy goes down? What if my session radius as some issue and some concern. What if one of my Cassandra nodes goes down? What about the latency again? Maybe we will leverage on a public network, you know? So it's internet, guys. So we can face different, different latency problem and in any case, connectivity problem. And what if one of my database suddenly stop? So start thinking about the worst possibility inside your system. And then the funny part, which is testing, go and test, run your experiment. What kind of experiment? Any kind of experiment, maybe hardware experiment, software experiment. Think about unpredictable way. Maybe it's not a failure. Let's say we run an e-commerce. So, uh, and it's November, it's Black Friday time of day here. And the traffic will suddenly increase in an, in an unexpected way. So I may want to test the condition as well, which is a very good condition, I have to say. I sell things, but I still need to test. And last but not least, think about security and malicious attacks as well. How to? Start very small, 
Be confident enough to start, but start very, very small. Don't think about, uh, from the very first time, a very, very complex pipeline. Maybe your system can fail in different way and you want to test it as well, but start testing feature by feature. Then be close to production. This is super important. We don't care about staging, QA. We care about production and you can test in pre-production if it's a mirror of your system, which should be but be close to production. You know, in Netflix, they test it directly in production. If you are brave enough, you can test directly in production. I never did. And then have a huge red button you can push on when there is an emergency, when something unpredictable, again, happen, when my system is seriously impaired. So have this red button. A stop condition is super important, an alarm, an alert, uh, anything. It's super important, automatic trigger, and have a rollback procedure. And another suggestion, don't have a manual rollback procedure. Implement some trigger automatic action. So we run the experiment, what, then what? It's like a real production issue. So we run, we do, we quantify the post-mortem. You may have some documentation, maybe a form to fill in. In any case, discuss uh, uh, the meantime to restore, how long did it take to restore? How long did it take to get notified? So check if in the backlog there was already an item talking about this possibility, this issue, and it happened. Uh, how, did, uh, how did it impact my system and my customer, I don't know, my database and my caching layer and so on, and which are the contributing factors as well? So once you do this, then, okay, you can go and fix it. You can increase the reliability for your system and please not keep testing. Test it again, test it under a different condition and then start testing another part of your system. So it's a cycle, you see, it's a reiteration. This is super important to stress. Okay, I've been talking about chaos engineering a few times and uh, well, not, may, not so few, but uh, any time, even when I talk with my colleagues or if I talk with my customer or ex-colleagues and so on, they say, you know, Marge, it's a very nice have. It's a nice have condition. Well, it's still considered a nice have, a plus to have inside our system. Why? Well, it's not easy. It's not easy to implement. It may require you to stitch together, work together with some different software, you know, scripts, uh, libraries to, to install as well, maybe something you need to write it on your own, and you need to stitch and combinate and create this pipeline for testing as well. Or if you leverage on third party, why not? You may need to install agent and libraries and maintain this part of your system. So you are adding a new layer to your system that may be already be distributed quite complex. And well, is it safe enough? It's up to you how you implement it. Am I running my testing in production? Am I running my testing in pre-production? Do I need to have my pre-production up and running? And remember my red, huge red stop button. Do I have a stop condition? Do I have a rollback procedure to save myself, to save my job as well? And real world conditions usually are a mix, a pipeline, a sum of different failures. So maybe it's not too easy to reproduce, you know, to think about the network, the infrastructure, the software part, the caching, the database, mix all of them. It may be quite complex as well. But let me, very, let me be very honest with you. It's even a cultural, a strong cultural challenge. Why? Well, my team may come and say, well, I don't have time or I don't have flexibility. I don't want to break things and start texting them or look, I'm already fixing things, you know? Why should I add additional entropy? Why should I add additional failure into my system while, while I'm day by day trying to fix my system, make it more reliable? And at the end of all of our experiments, it may result that our system resiliency is not as high as we thought. 
So maybe our, our initial points were not properly addressed and it can lead to very you know, uncomfortable and deep conversation too. So another video for you. We didn't start. It started. This is what I call an hot fix in production. You see, this guy is trying to change the wheel and you see, it's still riding, so it's worked. This is continuous delivery. You see the other guy with the new one and it works. I mean, it's chaos, but it works. So maybe the passenger is not comfortable. Maybe this ride will be rate zero over, over five, I don't know, but it still works. So now, how can we start implementing chaos in practice. So, yeah, start simple. Again, start very simple. You know your system, you can start by a singular part of your system. Kill a Docker container, why not? Then, TDOS yourself. Will your system um, be scaly? Will your system scale enough according to the traffic? DDoS yourself. Then add some latency to your network. Latency is a super important part. And then why, why don't we play with IP tables? Why don't we block DNS resolution? These are kind, kind of idea. I see someone is taking picture. Very well done, guys. And then additional possibility. Very funny, let me say. Run out of space, run out of memory, CPU, it's up to you. Again, it's funny to play with the network layer as well, packet loss, packet corruption. Start killing randomly some process, like the wild monk inside Netflix data center. Detach, amount your volumes, and why don't you play and edit your host file? So, tools for chaos engineering. No, there are not so many uh, nowadays. Some have open source. We already mentioned uh, Chaos Monkey. Then we have Gremlin, which is a commercial uh, product. And then the last one, you, you may not know it yet, but it's AWS Fault Injection Simulator. And we will, uh, I will show you a demo and we will break things with uh, AWS uh, Fault Injection Simulator as well. So this one is our focus for today. But in any case, when you start thinking how to add chaos engineering in your system, always remember that you are looking for something you don't know yet. So maybe leverage on third party and other people and other community experience may be a good starting point as well. I'm not talking only about you know, commercial products, even about open source, a community, um, community product as well. But today, yeah, we focus, about, uh, we focus on fault injection simulator, which is a way to simulate chaos engineering and unpredictable failure and outcomes inside our AWS system. It's super easy to get started. And again, I will show you in the demo. It can simulate easily real world condition and you can settle down some guardrails, you know, some safeguards, the red bottom to stop it. Why it is easy? Uh, well, you don't need to install anything. It's a totally managed service. It's a serverless service. Uh, you don't need to provision instance, install agent, libraries, anything like that. Uh, I will show you the console. I will run it through the AWS console, but you can use the CLI, you can use the API, or write, uh, write directly your code. You know, the AWS SDK in the most common programming languages. There are few create existing templates, or you can create your own templates. You can edit, reproduce, share maybe with another team your own template. Why not? And then it's easy, super easy to run real world con um, conditions. It means I can run different failures in parallel, uh, or I can run one by one, then let's wait for the result for the first one and then run a second one and it can target any kind of, any level of your system, which is infrastructure, the network, your instances, your containers, your Kubernetes environment as well. And please note, it will not run inside a sandbox. It will directly interact with your instances. So. Be sure to have this safeguard. You can define a stop condition. It's integrated with 
Amazon CloudWatch, which is our uh, monitoring and observability system. So you can uh, supervise, let's say, your experiment. There are some rollbacks already built in inside the service. You don't need to configure. And then IAM, it's identity and access management. It's a security service, service which means you can provide granularity access which means if inside my account I have, share, I have different environment staging, pre-production and production, let's say, which is not the best practice that you may have, then you can give granularity access just to not production or just to production. So what we are going to see, yeah, we are on time. Uh, it's a very simple architecture. I don't want to stress you on the architecture, on the architecture side. We do have uh, this first layer, which is an application load balancer. It's a layer for load balancing totally managed. Think about that. And then I have two instances, which are a kind of virtual uh, machine, and we will talk about that later. And then the last layer, which is Amazon RDS Aurora. It's a managed MySQL database. So we have a very, very simple web app. But again, you remember, even a simple environment needs to be stressed, needs to be tested. So, you may have seen availability zone, A, B, C, if it's the first time you heard this term. When we deploy anything inside AWS, we define a region, which is a geography, uh, geographical uh, region, a geography uh, area. And then we can deploy our services across different availability zones. A1 availability zone is a cluster of data center. So you can be redundant. You can increase your availability, deploying your workload in different, well, physical data center, but in any case, in different availability zone. What do I have here? It's named autoscaling group. So it's a way to supervise the number of instances I run because I want my workload to be resilient. And then, under the hood, we have this Amazon Aurora MySQL managed service where I have one primary and one read replica. The read replica is in another availability zone, so if one, the first availability zone, goes down or anything, any malicious action happened to my primary, then it will fail it over automatically to my second one. So what am I going to test? I will shut down the first instance and check if my system is resilient enough to deploy a new instance. And then I will shut down the, seco the, sorry, the primary uh, node for my database and check if it will fill it over into the second one. So I'm doing some hypotheses, as we have seen before. So my hypothesis is my system will still be up and running once I, you know, shut down the instance or shut down the first primary Aurora node. Let's see the demo. You know, everything fails, eventually fails all the time, so I recorded it. I prefer to. So this is uh, Amazon AWS console. These two are my EC2 instances. Think about a virtual machine. They are, you see, deployed across two different availability zones to have my system resilient. Then let's go to the balancing layer as well, which is our load balancer. Even this one is a managed service. I don't need to define the sizing, the backup, I don't know, anything like that. As you can see, I have some connectivity issue at home. But in any case, yeah, this is my load balancer. It has a DNS name, and I will uh, connect with that to show you a very, very simple website. It has a listener. It works on port 80, protocol HTTP. It's not production, so we can use HTTP instead of HTTPS. And it will forward the traffic evenly to my two instances that are so far up and running, so my system it's okay. I'm observing, you know, the steady state. So now I can check my target group, which are my two instances. Yeah, again, protocol HTTP, port 80. And I have two, you see, LT target. And again, it's just the two instances I've seen before. So the traffic is flowing through my two instances. Now I can check. I can check the website to see what kind of very simple website. 
and you will see, we just, you see, recover the metadata, which is the instance ID, it's a unique ID, and the availability zone for my instance. So a super simple one, no sticky session enabled, so I change the second one, I'm served by another EC2 instance. Let's check the scaling possibility and uh, this uh, superhero that makes sure that I have at least two instances running. So it's loading. Yeah, it's an auto scaling group. I may add some policy to scale automatically, but I just say, okay, I want two instances and between two and four instances. So it will make sure that I have at least two instances deploy in different availability zone. And I can check the activity, you see? I've already faced some failure before, and it was it terminates some instances and then launch a new one. But I want to test if today it will work as expected. Then let's go to our database. I just have oops one uh, cluster of database. It's one cluster but two instances. I have you see the writer instance deployed in availability zone C, and then I have the reader instance deployed in availability zone. B, which is important, and we will see why it's important in a few moments. And now I'm ready to check. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. It's a very simple other spook. And now we are ready to check, you know, our system and see if it's resilient enough. So let's go to the funny part. Let's go and break things. Let's go to Fault Injection Simulator, which is our service. Again, I'm showing you uh, the console, but you can do the same using the code, using CLI, directly the API, definitely as you prefer. I think this is the best way to see what happens, but you can do anything you like. So we can go and create our first template, and if it's the first time you use this service and any of our services, usually you see you have this kind of home page with very useful information, documentation, links, blog post link. The pricing as well is a pay-as-you-go service. So you pay only when you really use and run your, uh, your experience. You see you have the user guide, the service quotas, FAQ, and then you have some feature and benefit written here. But uh, I'm ready. Now I know my service and I'm ready to run an experiment. So I will first create a template. Again, I can reuse this template later. I just call it uh, EC2 Killer, which is super nice. And then we will have Aurora Killer as well. And I can add some actions. This is the core of my services. What can I do? Let's see. Action types. I will zoom a little bit. Yeah. Okay, I can settle down an alarm, an alert or I can work with my EC2 instances, which is reboot, stop, terminate. I can have access to my container as well. And this one, container service, we have ECS, which is a managed container docker uh, service. So I can stop some nodes or tasks, which are basically the container. I can terminate some node group inside my Kubernetes cluster as well. Otherwise, you know, some funny API related problem, throttling, any internal error or wait, adding latency into my network, why not? Then we have the RDS, Aurora RDS, which is our, our managed database service and we will work with that later. Otherwise, send command. This is a system manager. It's a way to send command. So you can do and simulate any kind of action you would like or leverage, you see, on this existing recipe, let's call them. Recipe to run out of CPU, stress your I.O., stress your memory. So it's totally up to you if you want to customize it or if you want to leverage an existing action as well. So let's go with EC2 and uh, we will terminate our instance. Let's see, let's see this one. And I select terminate instances. I can, you see, I can define a start after, so I can wait for any condition inside my system, but I will just play, play, and you will start. And then I have the target, not defined yet. So let me save this action. I can add additional action one by one or in parallel. It's up to me. 
but I don't want today, so I will remove and then edit the target part. So which part of my system will I perturbate? EC2, of course, we say it, and I can define using the resource ID, which is the unique ID, and since my service, my uh, workload is super simple, I will keep it, otherwise you can filter. You can check the tags, you can check the parameters of your EC2 instances and then filter in a very in a more dynamic way, let's say, but I will just keep a resource ID and then you can, uh, let's say, perturbate not all of your systems, just a part, but I, will, I just have one instance to perturbate. So let me save it. And service access, this is super important, granularity for the security permission. I already create what we call a role, which is a way to provide security policy. And this specific template will iterate and work just with EC2 instances. Red button, I can define a stop condition. It's a simple test, I don't want to. And then the login part. You can keep your log inside the AWS or if you have a CM or if you prefer, you can even uh, export them. I already create a log group inside CloudWatch, which is our observability. And then you can tag, uh, let's say, your, uh, your experiment too. And let's create. You didn't specify the stop condition, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. So let's create. Okay, it takes very few times and then we can review basically what is there. We have the list of action, we just have one action. And then we have the list of target as well, which is just one instance. But in any case, again, you can filter, have a proactive way to interact with your system. The next one is export. What if I want to share my template? I'm super proud of my template. I want to share with another team, another colleague. Well, I can. And then the timeline, which will be populated once we run, of course, our, our service. So we can go and start the experiment. Again, it will ask, uh, are you sure you are about to create a failure condition? So are you sure? Yeah, you can go and start. And now I'm about to terminate one of my instances and check if the auto-scaling will be aware of that and deploy a new instance. So I have initializing at state. Let's go and check the, the instances. Why not? If anything already happened to my instance. And it's loading. You see the instance state is shutting down now because they receive, you know, the termination command, and they are now ready to be shut down. In the meanwhile, the experiment is completed. Let's check the timeline. You see, completed again. It was just one action. And I have the time, how long did it take to run my experiment super quick, as you can see. What is very interesting, if I may have a more complex pipeline. Let's say I want to shuttle down my con a container and then my one of the nodes of my Kubernetes cluster and then my RDS and so on is checking the logs. You can keep them here, otherwise you can export them as well. But let's watch CloudWatch logs. We have this log stream. Okay. And you see, it will just print all the action, which is very simple. Let's start experiment and then looking after, looking for the target and if find out we have one instance. So here it will link, provide even the resources, you see, resolver targets, what I find. And then it will start the first action. So start action as well with the timestamp and all this information, like with what action and action ID as well. Okay, action is complete, was completed, and experiment was completed. We just had one action. Is it correct? Was it properly completed? Now we can go and check. EC2. In the meanwhile, you see, 
the last, the, the one which it would, should be terminated is terminated, and we have three instances now. So another one is in initializing state, so it will be ready shortly. Let's check the auto scaling. Was the auto scaling group or not? Let's see, let's see. Again, two, I want at least two instances, and let's check the activity. Yeah, he figured out when instance was unhealthy, so he removed from the auto scaling group this instance and launched a new instance to be ready to serve my traffic across the uh, load balancer as well. So we can check the website, it's still up and running, let's see. Yeah, and you see, this is the new instance. We didn't have the availability zone B before, so now we have another instance ready to serve our traffic. And what about our RDS? I want to test the failover for my database as well. So remember, primary is availability zone C, and writer, sorry, a reader is availability zone B. I create a very similar experiment. So it's Aurora Killer now. Okay, action for RDS. Let's see. It's the failover I want to test. So will the primary be switched off and automatically fail it over to the reader? The reader will be promote, let's see. Uh, my target, I just have one cluster of database, so it's quite simple. Again, I just define the resource ID I'm interested to, and all of them, of course. Again, security-related topics, I want to use a dedicated role for RDS only, for database only, stop condition if I want to, and the login part. I will use another log group, but it's up to you as you prefer uh, to have just one logging part. And then I can create. Again, you didn't add a stop condition. Are you sure you didn't put this huge red button? Yeah, again, I'm sure. So let's scroll down, it's quite similar to the previous one. We have action, target, we can export, reproduce our template, why not? The tagging part and the type li timeline will be populated. So, yeah, let's start it. Let's go and destroy our database. Again, are you sure? Yeah, you are about to perturbate. Start the experiment. And it's initializing, of course. Now we can scroll down and then check our DS console, our cluster C and B. I will refresh, but it will not work immediately. Just a little bit of spoiler. So let's see. And it's not completed our experiment yet. The failover might take a few seconds. So let's wait a few seconds more. Let's go back here. Now it's completed our experiment. I can finally check the logs and check the timeline. I will not go through the entire logs. We have already seen them just to see if it properly was logged, you know, for the bugging purpose and for future uses as well. So I have all of my log groups, yeah. And let's check, and you will see it's still in progress. You see the population of the log, the log part is still in progress. Yeah, six <laughs> minutes. Okay, and now it's okay, and the experiment is completed, started, and then, of course, completed. So I'm ready to go and check again my RDS. Why not? Let's check the timeline. It takes, you see, 47, a little bit more. It's still under a second, so it's very interesting. And C, M, B, and okay, now they switch. So the reader the read replica was promoted to the writer, to the master, to the primary replica, and the new reader replica was deployed. So actually it worked. Let's check the last point. So my website is still available, of course, and the database connection worked. So I'm speeding up a little bit.
Uh, again, we start from hypothesis, we test, and the idea was, will my website still be available? Will my autoscaling group take care of the number of instances and the resilience of my system? Yeah, it worked. And the same one for my RDS, which actually is a managed service, so I don't need to settle down in autoscaling way, but it will automatically recover and convert the reader replica to the primary replica, and it worked as well. So, last slide as well, almost the last one. Some resources, some useful links. Uh, go and check the principle of chaos engineering. If you want to propose a new definition, please go and, and do it. Uh, it's a very fluid word, let's say. Then the Netflix Chaos Monkey, it's uh, on GitHub. You can fork, you can work on it. It's a very nice way to, uh, to start to check what other uh, community are doing so far for chaos engineering. Uh, AWS related resources, we brought down different white papers, sorry. One of them is about reliability, which is one of our uh, pillars for a well-architected uh, system. And we have uh, also end-zone labs to improve the reliability, check and improve the reliability of your system. Then you have the documentation for this, the service I just show you, fault injection simulator. Again, it's totally managed. You see, I didn't provide anything, a virtual machine, a OS, anything like that it's automatically, it's a totally serverless approach. Then we have one of our builders library, which is a kind of work paper, and it will focus on the challenges for distributed system and unnecessary complex system uh, as well. It's a nice uh, thing to read. And then we have additional laboratories for chaos engineering, not leveraging on fault injection simulator. So if you may be already confident with some I don't know, serverless or container services in AWS, and uh, you don't want to use AWS fault injection simulator, there are some samples you can try there. So thank you guys again, happy to be here. If you want to connect, uh, reach out to me, drop an email, it's super simple. My family name, Bonetto, dot Amazon, dot, uh, at Amazon, sorry, uh, dot com, otherwise uh, reach uh, uh, connect on LinkedIn or I'm here till uh, early afternoon today. So if you want to talk about DevOps, talk about AWS, talk about chaos engineering or anything uh, you like, happy to, to support and to be here. So thank you.